Hello, I'm Kristen Priestall. Welcome to Horizon TV. Our focus today is on mental illness, which is a very common condition in our society, both inside and outside of corrections. Nearly 1.3 million people with mental illness are incarcerated in state and federal jails and prisons. And about 70,000 people are being served in psychiatric hospitals within the community. It's estimated that more than 60% of inmates nationwide suffer from a mental health disorder of some kind, most of them untreated until they became incarcerated. And this has caused an ever-growing increase in the number of patients our facilities are serving. Today, we'd like to take you behind the scenes at a Horizon facility that provides one of the best mental health programs in the industry. Horizon began providing services to the Doña Ana County Detention Center in Las Cruces, New Mexico in 2008. They came in with a service that we felt would uh, assist us and provide the right level of support that we needed medically and mental health wise. And to date, we have not been disappointed. They've done an outstanding job. Our facility tells maybe anywhere from 49 to 59% of people that have some kind of mental health history or has had some kind of mental health crisis sometime in their history. Jails today are not built for that. Before Horizon, we weren't ready for that. We still had the same number of people showing up in the jail with the mental health history and the mental health problems, but we just weren't ready to address it. What has happened with Horizon is that they came in, they assessed what we had at the time when we first invited them in, and they basically let us know this is what we need. So it was our job to make sure that we helped them make the job happen by providing the funds or whatever it was to make sure that we made it happen. Working with Horizon, the Doña Ana team determined that in order to provide enhanced services, they would need more space, more segregated areas, and more staffing to carry out their plans. We converted a whole pod, which would make up four day rooms. We took two day rooms and turned them into mental health living areas. And then we took a third day room and we turned it into a mental health clinic. Those three areas are within proximity of one another. So whenever we have a crisis, they can easily come across within 10 or 15 steps and start to diffuse that circumstance and diffuse it in a medical mental health clinic manner, not in an inmate manner. When people come into the facility, they are um, sc medically screened. If somebody's identified or admits to having some sort of mental health history, then they're referred to the mental health team. All referrals are triaged by the psychiatric RNs or the counselors, and they are put into a schedule and they are seen. It's very, very normal for us to encounter our patients that haven't had previous health care, and we are starting from zero and building them up, and getting them back up to health, getting them on the medications that they need, and levels and where they need to be at. Very common. When people come through booking and intake, we have rounds that are done every day. You know, they identify those people that have mental health issues. So, you know, day one, they're getting segregated information-wise and we're getting them on their meds, we're getting them counseling. So a lot of people are, are getting seen within the first week. More than that, we also have mental health pods for the males and the females where they get group therapy, they get goal settings. I mean, every day they're getting challenged to do something above and beyond just, you know, doing your time and trying to sleep out the whole sentence. I mean, they're getting challenged to come up with, you know, therapeutic goals every day, which again, brings them together more as a team and takes them outside themselves so that they can get more of that sense of community in them before they get out. Caring for the mental health population is definitely a joint effort. Because of the differences in caring for these patients, all correctional officers have received specialized training. The facility's team is comprised of several employees who meet weekly with the Horizon team to review patient needs and make any adjustments to treatment plans. It's everybody in the mental health. Um, and then we have the major and we have classification that comes in and the medical lieutenant and then we kind of go over everybody that's in segregation and we also check to see how they're doing in those pods whether they're benefiting or not and so we kind of decide as a team who should stay and who shouldn't and then who should go in. It's really important for the officers and medical to work together. They need to be able to understand what each other's needs are because they're different. They're totally different. The medical people are here to provide medical care and mental health care. And when you talk to the medical people, they refer to the inmates as clients. The people that I have here medically and mental health are in the right mindset because they're looking at them as clients, not as inmates, not as prisoners. My security staff, on the other hand, is looking at them as prisoners. 
And that means they're not forgetting that their part is security. Based on the individual health plans devised for each patient, counselors provide customized counseling and treatment, as well as group therapy and pods throughout the facility. We give special attention to the segregation rounds and you know what the information we get back from the mental health techs and that helps us determine if we're going to pull someone out for that day or if they're starting to deteriorate to where we need to bring up our protest about them being in segregation to the next level and maybe get them in a mental health pod instead. In those pods what they do is they do in-depth counseling and they have groups and goal settings so it kind of teaches the detainee to learn a different way to cope, to make a decision. By working together with the client, Corizon is also able to provide significant cost savings to them by enhancing the level of mental health services provided on site at the facility. We were sending out all our people with mental health crisis. I wouldn't say all, but we were able to send the most chronically needy of those mental health crises, about 12 of them out. And it was costing us a big amount of dollars just to do that. Well, with Horizon, we got together, processed through some ideas, we brainstormed here a little bit. We are able here at the site to um, provide all mental health services in-house, so we don't necessarily need to contract or work with community resources on the outside uh, for mental health services. I've seen a number of jails, and I think besides this one, I've seen two other jails with a program similar to ours. And I think that our program is even more detailed than those two jails. And they've had their program are longer than us. Client partnerships like the one between Doña Ana and Corizon show what great things can be accomplished when you work as a team for the common goal. For the employee focus, we turn our spotlight on Corizon's new CEO, Dr. Woodrow A. Myers, Jr. Dr. Myers became CEO of Corizon in October 2013 and is working hard to take our company to the next stage of success. As we'll see, his experience in the fields of medicine, business, government, and public policy provide a unique perspective. Today, he will share his background and vision for the future of Corizon. I was born and raised in Indianapolis. I uh, went to school there all the way through high school. Uh, I went to college in California. Decided that I was going to be uh, pre-med and finish that program at Stanford and then got admitted to medical school in Boston on the other side of the country at Harvard. After completing his undergraduate work at Stanford and receiving his medical degree from Harvard, Dr. Meyer sought to help the patients who needed it the most. I liked taking care of the sickest patients in the hospital and. It was one of the first experiences as well that sort of began to sensitize me to all the various management decisions that have to be made in healthcare. It sensitized me also to the tremendous costs that were involved. And as a part of that, I went to uh, get my MBA degree at the Stanford School of Business and was really able to merge my interest in healthcare with my interest in management, my interest in learning about finance, and, and get to a point where I thought I could be effective in all of those arenas at the, at the same time. Dr. Meyer's interest in medicine, business, and public health led him to develop health care policy for governors, senators, and presidents. I took an opportunity as the physician health advisor to the United States Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources. At that time, the Senator Ted Kennedy was the leading member of the minority party in that committee, worked as his physician health advisor for a while, but then was attracted back to my home state of Indiana to become the health commissioner. And I began to understand more the politics of medicine, the politics of business, and that paid off as well. From a physician working on the front lines of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, to serving as the health commissioner for both the state of Indiana and New York City, and then leading some of the top healthcare companies in the world, Dr. Myers brings a wealth of expertise to his role as CEO of Corizon. From the uh, academic side of healthcare to the administrative side of healthcare to the management side of healthcare to the political side of healthcare, and all of those experiences have sort of kept me up to speed in a whole variety of areas, and it's made me the the uh, the, the, the guy I am today. Uh, now taking on some some new challenges and new responsibilities. For employees, Dr. Myers also shared his vision for the future of Corizon. He wants all employees to know that adapting, moving quickly, and staying on top of your game are the keys to success. I would say to my thousand docs and my six thousand nurses, uh, keep doing what you're doing, but be prepared to do more, be prepared to do it faster, be prepared to do it 
in a less expensive way, be prepared to measure your quality of the services that you're providing in a far more rigorous way because each, each month, each quarter, each year, we're going to ratchet it up because we've got to stay ahead of the curve. Healthcare is moving very quickly. It's moving faster now than it's ever moved in the history of this planet. We've got to stay on that curve, if not ahead of that curve. And I expect that anybody that's on the Corizon team will have that attitude. Thanks, Dr. Myers, for sharing your story with us. We look forward to working under your leadership to continue making Corizon the best healthcare company in the business. As a grand finale to their community service efforts for 2013, Team Corizon focused on several charities and outreach projects. Teams from Charlotte, Collier, Lee, and Okaloosa County Jails in Florida and the Southeast Regional Office recently teamed up to support the Wounded Warrior Project. They're participating in a Tough Mudder Obstacle Course Challenge, and they raised more than $900 in just two weeks. To show their personal gratitude during the Thanksgiving season, employees at the St. Louis Operations Office reached out to the Operation Food Search Organization and even brought family members to volunteer their time in organizing and preparing food for distribution. Operation Food Search feeds approximately 150,000 people every month, and about one-third of the recipients are children. One of the company-wide charities for 2013 was United Way, with a corporate contribution of $5,000. Through a variety of fundraisers and donation opportunities, employees continued to build on this support. One of the efforts was Dress Down Denim Days for a cash contribution. Through combining all fundraisers and payroll pledges, employees donated more than $24,000 to add to the corporate donation of $5,000 to United Way. Brentwood corporate office employees held a very successful food drive for Nashville's Second Harvest Food Bank, which provides close to 20 million meals a year throughout a 46 county area. The Florida Region 2 office staff adopted 20 children and donated Christmas gifts for them. These children have been assigned temporary court appointed guardians. And this effort was in support of the Florida Council on Crime and Delinquency Guardian Ad Litem Program. A Soldier's Child is an organization that gives to the families of our servicemen and women who are away from home at Christmas. The corporate marketing department sponsored a family with three young children and filled their Christmas lists. Thanks to ongoing efforts by Team Corizon to give back by supporting charity organizations, we are well represented nationally and in our local communities. That wraps up this episode of Corizon TV. Until next time, thanks for watching.